Northern India, the Eternal, where palaces of the Maharajas and Mughal temples, multicolored festivities, and the Taj Mahal intermix with Indian megalopolises, creating an unlikely and indescribable mix. Its various ethnicities, its few thousand years of history, and its multiple religious groups reveal the rich heritage and the great cultural diversity of India. Delhi is often unfairly ranked below neighboring Agra and Rajasthan. Yet the capital of the biggest democracy in the world is highly reflective of the grandeur and ambivalences of modern day India. Today, two cities coexist within Delhi. New Delhi, the most recent, was settled by the British during colonization. To the north, Old Delhi dates back to the Mughal era. Old Delhi seems to echo the stereotypical image of India, congested, busy, throbbing and odorous, and especially full of light. A world of rickshaws, saris and free-roaming cows. Along with a rather peaceful atmosphere, Delhi offers a nice image of intermingled ethnic groups. At the heart of Old Delhi stands the impressive Red Fort, today a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The Mughal Empire, which flourished in the 16th century, left its mark on Delhi, its former capital. Both conquerors and aesthetes, the Mughals created a city on par with their military power. The Red Fort was built by the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan around 1640. It's a gigantic complex with towers standing atop its massive walls. The fort derives its name from the red sandstone that was used to build it. The surrounding wall is nearly 2.5 kilometers long and 33 meters high on the side that faces the city. Passing through the monumental Lahore Gate and behind its austere walls lies a luxuriant garden interspersed with imperial palaces, marble mosques, and Mughal pavilions formerly decorated with precious stones. The palace was modeled after the image of paradise described in the Quran. On one of the walls, a simple phrase evokes this most famous epic, if there's a paradise on earth, here it is. It is easy to imagine the powerful Mughals nonchalantly smoking nargil beneath the colonnades of the chiseled marble palaces. The two most emblematic buildings of the Red Fort are the two audience halls. The Diwan Ayam, where the emperor, seated on a throne, received official guests, and the Diwan Ay Khas, for private audiences. 
The D1IM hall was decorated with stuccos and included a series of gold columns. It also included a large railing that separated the commoners from the emperor. From his balcony in a canopied alcove, the emperor heard complaints from his subjects. The red fort is considered to represent the peak of Mughal creativity, which, under the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan, attained an even higher degree of refinement. The palace's layout was influenced by Islamic architecture, but each pavilion includes elements that are typical of Mughal architecture, reflecting a fusion of Persian, Timurid, and Hindu traditions. The innovative design and architectural style of the Red Fort, and especially its gardens, heavily influenced ulterior constructions in Rajasthan and neighboring regions. The gardens are irrigated by the Yamuna River, reoriented to this end. The private apartments are made up of a row of pavilions that are linked by a canal called the River of Paradise, which flows through the center of each pavilion. The Red Fort Palace complex is among the best examples of Mughal architecture, and it is one of India's most popular tourist attractions, drawing millions of visitors each year. In the Diwan Aikas, the private audience hall, the emperor met with his courtesans and with official state guests. The hall is comprised of a rectangular chamber with arched openings supported by pillars on all sides. South of the palace lies the sumptuous Rang Mahal, known for its marble pool that is filled by the Paradise River, and for its marble sculptures that emphasize the skill and know-how of Mughal artists and artisans. Its pillars and beautifully decorated golden ceiling leaves the visitor breathless. West of the Hammam stands Moti Masjid, the Pearl Mosque. It is a small three-domed mosque carved in white marble with a triple arched facade. Built for the successor of Shah Jahan, it was added to the complex in 1659. The Red Fort has symbolized the seat of power since the reign of the Mughal Emperor Shah Jahan. It has also witnessed the changes Indian society experienced under British domination, and it was also the site where India celebrated its independence in 1947. To this day, Independence Day is celebrated here on August 15th. Chandni Chok is a major shopping road located further down the Red Fort. Around this busy avenue, full of cars and rickshaws, lies a huge bazaar. The Moonlight Market, built in the 17th century by the Mughal Emperor, was once intersected by canals that reflected the moonlight. Today, it is one of the biggest wholesale markets of India. The bazaar contains many specialized markets. Saris and traditional clothing are found in Fatehpuri. Dariba Kalan and Kinari Bazaar are known for their silverware and jewelry. Kari Baoli is a delight for the senses, selling dried fruit, spices and grains. A giant beehive, Chandni Chok, is a must-see. One of the facets of lively, colorful and spicy India. Located opposite the Red Fort and built in 1656, Digambar Temple is the capital city's oldest Jain temple. Jainism, from the Sanskrit word Jina, the conqueror, is a religion that prescribes nonviolence. It is based on the theory of karma and reincarnation, on ecology and plurality, and prescribes asceticism. It is one of the most ancient religions of the world, originating in antiquity or even prehistory, around 3000 to 3500 BC. 
It disseminated its teachings to all, regardless of ethnicity, gender, or age. The temple is very popular, and the devout come bearing offerings such as fruit, grains, rice, and even candles. Due to their rigorous adherence to the precepts and ethics of Jainism, the Jains have become very well represented in the cultural, political, and business sectors of India. Indeed, the Jain community has the highest literacy rate of India. The biggest mosque of India is located, unsurprisingly, in Delhi, once the pinnacle of Muslim culture under the Mughals. Jama Masjid, the Friday mosque, can hold up to 25,000 people. Made of red sandstone, its design is distinctly Mughal and includes a vast paved courtyard surrounded by three high gates. The highest gate was reserved for the emperor only. Its stones, cupolas, and minarets make it easily identifiable from a distance. Also built during the reign of Emperor Shah Jahan, the mosque was linked to the Red Fort by an underground passageway. Below the three bulbous red and white domes, the mosque echoes the majesty of a people who clearly left their mark on Delhi and northern India, the Mughals. When the Muslims seized Delhi in the 12th century, they erected a monument to represent their faith and their power. Kup Minar, a majestic tower over 70 meters high, is to this day among the world's highest minarets. The Kut Minar complex contains many other buildings and the first mosque of India. According to an engraving above the eastern entrance, it was built from materials obtained in the demolition of 27 idolatrous temples. Extracted materials revealed that the recycled elements were taken from Jain and Hindu temples. Certain parts of the mosque are decorated with floral motifs and calligraphies, a masterpiece of Hindu-Muslim art. Everything lies in the details, from the sculpted surahs to the flowering carvings. With over 150 million followers, Islam is today the greatest religious minority of India. The first Muslims arrived in India in the 8th century, first for trade, then for war. The peak of their conquest lies in the expansion of the Mughal Empire in the 16th century. Ever since, Hindus and Muslims have tried to live together in harmony. West of the mosque lies the tomb of Iltutmish, the builder of the minaret. This was a novelty for India, where tradition called for cremation of the dead. Humayun's tomb is a complex of Mughal architecture. The site contains the tomb of the eponymous emperor. The sculpted stone works here are enchanting. This is perhaps one of the most beautiful sites of Delhi. One must spend time here to soak in the landscape model of paradise on earth. The fountains, invaded by squirrels, gurgle serenely. Surrounded by Persian-style gardens, Humayun's tomb is a huge mausoleum made of red sandstone and white marble. It was built in his honor from 1565 to 1569 by his widow, Haji Begum. It is the first example of Mughal architecture. It exemplifies the splendor of Mughal art with its arcades and its dome. Designed by a Persian architect, 
and built by 300 Arabic artisans. This type of funerary monument reached the peak of its glory with the construction of the Taj Mahal mausoleum in Agra. Humayun's tomb was designated a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1993. The sober aspect of the tombs inside the mausoleum stands in contrast to the luxuriant exterior decorations. Northern India and the Mughal Triangle, the cradle of Buddhism and Hinduism, heavily influenced by Islam, dominated by Mughal emperors and Maharajas, and later by the British, truly forms a cultural and religious mosaic, a colorful and bright melting pot. Jantar Mantar is an astronomical observatory that was built in the 13th century by the Maharaja Jai Singh II, who also initiated the Jaipur Observatory in neighboring Rajasthan. It contains a wealth of astronomical instruments devoted to studying the path of the stars, to establish astrological birth charts, and to determine the most suitable time for important events, such as weddings and political decisions. The name is derived from yantra, meaning instrument, and Mandir, temple, thus, the temple of instruments. South of Delhi lies Agra, heaven. Agra was the capital city from the 16th to the 17th century. It reached the height of its glory under the successive reigns of the emperors Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. The latter ordered the construction of the Taj Mahal in 1631 before transferring the capital city to Delhi. Today, Agra draws millions of tourists due to its majestic and famous mausoleum. Among the 20,000 people who worked on the construction site were master artisans from Europe and Central Asia. The head architect was Yusad Ahmad from the city of Lahore. The Taj Mahal funerary complex was built using materials sourced from various regions in India and Asia. The white marble was extracted from Rajasthan, the jasper from Punjab, the turquoise and malachite from Tibet, and sapphires and lapis lazuli from Sri Lanka, the coral from the Red Sea, the cornelian from Yemen, the onyx from Persia, the garnets from the Ganges River, and the rock crystal from the Himalayas. All in all, 28 types of precious and semi-precious stones were used in the calligraphies and inlaid motifs displayed on the white marble. Over 1,000 elephants were used to transport the necessary material. Seen from the gardens, the majesty of the Taj Mahal is beyond impressive. One walks slowly, as in a dream, towards this tomb of white marble, enshrouded in a cloudy mist that accentuates its magical appearance. The gardens were designed to reflect the description of paradise, with its four rivers of water, milk, wine, and honey. The tomb's central dome is surrounded by four identical minarets. The monument is perfectly symmetrical. This sublime white marble mausoleum arose from Emperor Shah Jahan's passionate love for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal, which is Persian for light of the palace. 
She died on June 17, 1631, while giving birth to their 14th child. Devastated by her death, he wanted to give her the greatest homage possible. Thus, this majestic and poetic monument. Listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Taj Mahal is the leading tourist attraction of India, drawing in 2.5 million visitors annually. Perhaps the relative beauty of the Taj Mahal is a deliberate means of reflecting the absolute beauty of God. Left of the Taj Mahal is a red sandstone mosque that stands in stark contrast to the Taj Mahal's white marble. The Jama Masjid Mosque was built in order to sanctify the site and serves as a place of worship for pilgrims. To its right, an exact replica of the mosque maintains the complex's architectural symmetry. But this edifice is not used as a mosque since it does not face Mecca. The two monuments stand on a vast platform set atop the front terrace. The arches frames and the timpanis are covered in white marble. The timpanis are entirely covered with stone inlaid floral arabesques. The mosque and the pavilion's design are identical. They both consist of a massive oblong prayer room with three rows of vaulted ceiling. The arches are lined with twisted rope-shaped moldings. The passages of the Quran that are calligraphied on the walls of the Taj Mahal are apparently intended to characterize the site as the reproduction of paradise. A true allegory of Judgment Day when the dead come before God and God tells them, you, peaceful soul, be among my servants and enter into my paradise. Near the gardens of the Taj Mahal stands the Red Fort of Agra, a significant Mughal monument from the 17th century. With its perimeter walls spanning 2.5 kilometers, this powerful citadel made of red sandstone contained the imperial city and a great number of palaces. Established as a capital city by the Mughals, Agra necessarily needed to have its own red fort. And from the fort, the Emperor Shah Jahan could contemplate the Taj Mahal, where his beloved wife rested in peace. Like Delhi's fort, the fort in Agra stands as one of the greatest symbols of the Mughal Emperor's grandeur, which reached new heights under Akbar, Jahangir, and Shah Jahan. Behind the surrounding walls, Jahangir Mahal Palace was built by Akbar for his son Jahangir. The Mahal was the woman's main palace and was mainly used by Akbar's wives. It is a combination of Central Asian and Hindu architecture. The Red Fort's monuments mark the peak of an Indo-Muslim art form with strong Persian influences. The Imperial Citadel thus contains a large number of fairy tale like palaces, such as the Kas Mahal, the Shish Mahal, the Octagonal Tower, and the Audience Halls built under the luxurious reign of Shah Jahan. Two very beautiful mosques can also be seen within the palace complex, one of which is the Pearl Mosque. Diwan Ayem, the public audience hall, was added to the Red Fort by Shah Jahan in 1628. The flat roof is supported by three rows of beautifully decorated and sculpted pillars.
This is where the emperor heard his subjects' complaints while seated on silken carpets, and where he received his ministers while gazing elsewhere, he dreamed about his bereaved and beloved wife since. <laughs> 260 kilometers southwest of Delhi, Rajasthan, literally the country of kings, offers a series of sumptuous, beautiful palaces. It is the opportunity to visit Jaipur Palace in the state's capital. The name Jaipur is derived from Jai, victory, and Pur, city. It was founded in 1727 by the Maharaja Jai Singh, a famous astronomer and mathematician. The city follows a grid pattern, and its surrounding walls are six meters high and four meters wide. It is accessed through one of eight gates. The original Jaipur contained large avenues 34 meters wide, while the remaining roads that made up the grid were at least four meters wide. A surprising organization amidst the Baroque chaos that reigns in most cities of the Indian subcontinent. The city palace of Jaipur is a complex located northeast of the city. The first constructions were made at the initiative of Jai Singh II between 1729 and 1732, a time when the exterior walls were built. Successive additions followed by various leaders until the 20th century. The city palace holds an impressive amount of inner courtyards, gardens and monuments. The complex was the seat of the Maharaja of Jaipur. The structure is accessed by Rajendra Pol, a magnificent gate decked by two marble sculpted elephants. The audience hall, Diwan Aikas, entirely covered in marble, stands in the middle of the courtyard. And here we delve into the marvelous world of the Havelis, the palaces of the Maharajas. Jai Singh II, the mathematician, took part in designing his own residence, which is still partially occupied by the Maharaja's family. The rest of the palace is a museum. In the room, two gigantic silver jars, the biggest in the world, are displayed, as well as sumptuous crystal chandeliers. now in front of the Moon Palace. Today, most of the palace is occupied by the descendants of the first leaders of Jaipur. Only the museum on the ground floor can be visited. Chandra Mahal is seven stories high, and each floor has its own name. Balconies encased in glass or decked in ceramic decorations are typical. On the roof, a pavilion topped with the royal family's flag offers a panoramic view over the gardens and the entire city. Within these Indian palaces, nostalgia runs thick, and one imagines all the intrigues that unraveled beneath the luxurious facades. The Moon Palace is undoubtedly a prime example of Indian kitsch. The Mubarak Mahal, or Welcome Palace, is a mix of Mughal, Rajput, and European styles, built in 1890 by the Maharaja Madho Singh II as a residence for his guests. Today, it is part of the museum. The Maharaja's wardrobe is on display here, rising two meters high and weighing 250 kilograms. He had 108 wives. With a passion for mathematics, astronomy and astrology, 
King Jai Singh II had five observatories constructed in northern India in the 1720s. The observatory of Jaipur, inspired by the one in Delhi, is the most impressive. The observatory contains a series of specialized astronomical instruments. Its large-scale calculating instruments have interested a number of architects, historians, and scientists throughout the world, from their conception to modern times. This is the biggest sundial in the world, rising 27 meters high. It measures time up to two seconds. Another particularity of Jaipur. At the intersection of Tripoli a Bazaar, a fragile edifice rises above the avenue, Hawa Mahal, the aptly named Wind Palace. Built in 1799 as a place of fresh air for the Maharaja's wives and concubines in summer, 953 windows and balconies decorate the five-story facade, letting the air in and enabling the women to see outside while preventing them from being seen. Seen from the street, the narrowness of this interesting edifice goes unnoticed, merely four to five meters maximum on the fifth floor. The city wasn't originally uniformly pink as it is today, but displayed a range of colors from gray to white. The entire city was painted in pink for Prince Albert's visit in 1876, pink being the traditional color of welcome. To mark the occasion, the British built a beautiful edifice before even thinking about its purpose. Nearly a century and a half later, the Albert Hall Museum has not budged, and visitors come here to admire a collection of crafts and mural paintings. Its Indo-Saracenic architecture and stone decorations have become a source of reference for various classical Indian styles. The Rambagh Palace of modest size was built in 1835 to house a private servant to the queen, the nurse of Prince Ram Singh II. The building, then surrounded by a thick forest, was converted into a hunting lodge in 1887. A palace built on this site by the architect Sir Samuel Jacob in the early 20th century later became the summer residence of the Maharaja. The palace was occupied by the royal family until 1957. But due to the major maintenance expenses of the palace and its 19 hectare gardens, the Maharaja decided to convert the palace into a luxury hotel. Leaving Jaipur, the road to Delhi follows a placid lake at the center of which an abandoned palace seems to float. Painted in the colors of a sunset, the Jal Mahal is magical. The palace has five floors. The first floor routinely flooded during the rainy season when the level of the lake rises. The chhatris at the four corners are octagonal. The middle one is the rectangular chhatri. Further down the road rises another image of eternity. Overlooking a gorge, a powerful fortress on a rocky peak stands protected by a second higher bastion. Here is Amber, the former capital of the Maharajas of Jaipur and Jaigarth. Amber was first mentioned by the Egyptian Ptolemy, pioneer of geography in the first millennium. Founded by Raja Alan Singh, Amber was already a flourishing city before 1000 AD. Amber is not reached effortlessly. There are those who sweat their way up on foot. Others take a jeep, or they arrive on colorfully covered elephants to reach the gate of the sun.
Like most Indian fortresses, Amber has its own public audience hall. Built in the 17th century, the architecture of this hall is purely Hindu and differs from the Mughal style that is commonly seen in northern India. The Hindu columns, capitals, and arches differ from the multi-lobed Islamic arches. Ganesh Pole is the ceremonial gate that leads to the private quarters and palaces of the sovereigns. The gate is decorated with colorful mural paintings displaying a heavy Mughal influence. The screened windows on the upper floors enabled women to see outside in accordance with the purda, which prevents women from being seen by men. Amber was founded in the 12th century at the intersection of the roads to Delhi and Agra. It was a capital city for over five centuries. Expanded and embellished over the years, the fortress came to include vast palaces built over successive terraces. And when the king moved the capital to Jaipur, Amber was not abandoned. Not only did Amber maintain an essential role in the military defense of the new city, but it also remained over many decades an important governmental and religious site. Indeed, Jai Singh maintained a double title as Maharaja of both Amber and Jaipur. There are innumerable spaces to be discovered. In the Zenana Bagh, the women's garden, water is piped through the walls to refresh in the atmosphere. The fountain was perfumed with rose water. During his reign from 1621 to 1667, King Jai Singh I had many temples erected and expanded his palace to the point that it became not unlike those of the great Mughal emperors, containing public and private audience halls modeled off of those in Agra. With its ceiling covered in gold, mirrored glass, and ivory mosaic, the hall at Jai Mandir represents the utmost refinement. The successive courtyards, the hypostyle halls that open out onto balconies, and the mucharabias, the decorations sculpted in stone, the gold leaf paintings, all add to the splendor of the palace. In the idyllic site that comprises the ladies' apartments, the Maharaja's 12 wives and his concubines remained cloistered. Each had her own private apartment, giving out onto the courtyard of the Ram Singh Palace, where they would gather together in a site rife with intrigue and betrayal. Amber Palace was thus designed to be a major site in the development of Jaipur, the creation of double city territory enclosed by surrounding walls spanning a 50 kilometer periphery. Raja Jai Singh I brought many fine arts workshops to the city, as well as artists. Highly cultured, he spoke Hindi, Persian, Turkish, and Arabic. Such openness onto the Mughal and Persian worlds led Amber to become a place of major cultural activity. Shortly thereafter, in the late 18th century and early 19th century, the successors of Jai Singh II slowly abandoned the hillside site. Further west, the city of Jodhpur in the state of Rajasthan is also known as the Gate to the Desert due to its proximity to the neighboring Tar Desert in northern India. Jodhpur is also called City of Sun since it benefits from sunny skies all throughout the year. Under the Mughal Empire, the city knew a true time of prosperity, of cultural and commercial exchange. Jodhpur continued to prosper in the 19th century under the British Raj. The merchants of Jodhpur came to occupy a dominant position in Indian trade. Jodhpur was a strategic site for the ruling elite, especially due to its opium, coffee, and spice trade with Delhi. 
The clock tower was built in 1910 by the Maharaja Sardar Singh to mimic the British, and especially to supply the people with a public clock. In 1947, India became independent and Jodhpur became the second greatest city in the new state of Rajasthan, following Jaipur. Sardar Bazaar stretches out around the clock tower in a labyrinth of alleys and dead ends, some of which are specialized in cloths, scarves, and airy pashminas. There are also the magical drapings that are saris. Sardar Bazaar gets going around 11.30 and reaches its peak activity in the late afternoon. It is both the center of activity and the economic center of the old town. After having crossed through the bazaar and walked up the promontory in the blue quarter of the Brahmins, the upper caste in India, we reach Marangar Fort, one of the most imposing forts of India. This magnificent fort, made of ochre limestone, overlooks the city from its height of 135 meters. Richly decorated palaces adorned with numerous courtyards are found inside the fort. The fortress was built in 1459 like an eyrie by the founder of Jodhpur, the Rao Jodha, who lent his name to Jodhpur. The fort is accessed through the Victory Gate. Superb facades can be viewed from the inner courtyards, and the fort contains historical collections. It is a combination of intermingling palaces and courtyard. The Maharajas lived at Merangar until the early 20th century. Hence its name, Mirangar, meaning Majestic Fort. Sangar Choki, the coronation seat of the kings made of red sandstone, is spectacularly decorated. According to legend, the fortress was built on the site where the old hermit Chiriya Natji, the lord of the birds, lived. The hermit was displaced from the site and in his wrath cast a terrible curse on the kingdom. To propitiate the curse, the king is said to have buried a man alive in the foundations. The museum exhibits the heritage of the ruling class, such as clothing and arms. A collection of palaquins can be admired here. Most notable is the Mahadol, richly sculpted and gilded in the 18th century. It is an armchair bearing more or less luxurious decorations. The royal family also used them on special occasions. This gallery exhibits one of the richest collections of palaquins and elephant chairs. From an architectural standpoint, the museum is one of the most beautiful in northern India, and more specifically, it contains some of the richest collections of Rajasthan. It is a perfectly preserved treasure of the Mughal period, a time during which the local sovereigns maintained close ties with the Muslim emperors. The museum also contains rooms that are still furnished and decorated as in their time of glory. The flower palace, Pul Mahal, dates back to the 18th century and was entirely devoted to sensual pleasure. The royal bedroom was built around 1850. It is an interesting mix of both traditional and modern styles. Certain details reveal a notable British influence, like these Christmas tree decorations added to the ceiling in the 1930s. This part of the palace was built by the Maharaja Takut Singh, the last sovereign of Jodhpur to reside in the fortress. Pigskin collages and paintings on the walls represent European-looking women in traditional Indian lovemaking scenes. Shisha Mal can be found in most palaces in the region. The one at Marangar Fort was designed in pure Rajput style. The mirrors are topped by religious figures painted in lively colors. The typical platform is magnificent. Janki Mahal contains a rich collection of royal cradles, decorated with gilded mirrors and figures of fairies, elephants, and birds. 
we are in the women's quarters. The wives' apartments are located within Zenana Deori Square. All the wives and concubines of the Maharaja resided in the inner sanctum, guarded by eunuchs. The screens and fine sandstone sculptures are highly intricate. From the path at the top of the citadel, behold a panoramic view of the city below. Jodhpur is commonly called the Blue City, as blue symbolizes India's upper caste. Blue is also said to refract heat and to repel mosquitoes. Umad Bhawan Palace was the palace of the Maharaja of Jodhpur. Its impressive cupola can be seen from any point within the city. Completed in 1944 on the eve of India's independence, Umayyad Bhawan is India's last great palace. The Maharaja built this incredible construction to counter the high unemployment rate and famine that Jodhpur suffered in the 1930s. The English architect designed this palace as if the empire of the British Indies were to last a thousand years. Umayyad Bhawan Palace is divided into three parts, the Maharaja's residence, the hotel, and the museum on the ground floor. Every room, every corner within the palace reeks of the time of colonization. Jaswant Tada is a superb white marble temple built in memory of King Jaswant Singh II. It exemplifies the talent and skill of Indian architecture. This funerary complex contains the tombs of Jodhpur's kings. On the terrace in front of the temple runs a long line of cenotaphs of the various Maharajas. Unfairly nicknamed Little Taj, the main monument was built like a temple. It is a white marble memorial, built from finely sculpted thin marble sheets. As a result, the exterior walls emit a warm glow when the sun's rays fall upon it. These stones are extremely fine and polished. The sculptures reveal the genius of the sculptors. The cenotaph of the Maharaja Jaswant Singh also displays beautifully sculpted marble. The walls are decorated with portraits of the Maharajas in memory of the past. Forgotten floating palaces, fortified citadels of red and ochre stone, alleys full of roaming sacred cows, and between two palaces, the omnipresent spirit of the Maharajas. Rajasthan is a dream, but not an illusion, the embodiment of Mughal art in all its splendor in northwestern India. Religions intersect and blend here, offering visitors a glimpse of their most beautiful adornments. A rich blend, manifested even in the dazzling chromatic scheme that brightens the monuments. From the men's turbans to the women's saris, from the deep countryside to the lively cities so typical of the subcontinent.